போகுது Good morning everyone. I'm Dr. Pragati, consultant department of he teaches TAFE University graduate and medical advanced trainees. He has over 250 papers and published abstract in transfusion, virology and molecular genetics in the scientific literature. We welcome here you sir. I will now hand over to Dr. C, marketing head for orthoclinical diagnostics to take over the proceeding. Good morning to all. Thank you, ma'am, for uh, giving us an opportunity to interact with you all in today's uh, session. So we are proud to be associated with uh, Asian Institute of Gastroenterology. So we are from Orthoclinical Diagnostics. Maybe aware that it's a more than 81 years old organization with a lot of innovative products especially in the field of transfusion medicine with the introduction of first anti d introduced by orthoclinical diagnostics and there are multiple lot of innovative products uh, which are associated with the gastroenterology like the first anti hcv screening assays uh, was introduced by orthoclinical di diagnostics Today, we are welcoming all for this uh, scientific session in the field of immunohematology. Because we are all aware about the importance of blood and blood components for the patients. Because during the course of surgery, it's required. And blood is a miracle medicine which cannot be manufactured from the industry the source of blood is we all the donors and those blood will be made safe and then given to the patients in the department of transfusion medicine one is blood is a double edged knife it can give life if it is a unsafe blood it can also take life so which is very important to understand the importance of blood so are we able to provide the safe compatible blood or blood components to the patients or not when you see the blood we all know that there are blood groups so we know the most common blood groups are either a b ab or o and the another blood group whether it is rh positive or negative but beyond that there are various other blood groups more than 250 blood group antigens are present on our rbc which majorly we may not focus that but it becomes very important especially in case of multi transfusion patients because out of these various antigens the donor may have certain antigens but the patients may not have that antigens so when such a bloods are transfused so there is an opportunity for allo immunization so once the allo immunization starts and it's becoming difficult to get the compatible blood units so it's very important to understand the blood the various blood group antigens and how we can able to manage those multi transfusion cases especially the sickle cell anemia or thalassemia even in some of the 
patients we may have to give multiple transfusions so today's session is designed for that to understand more about what are the blood group antigens other than whatever we commonly knows this ab1 and the rh blood group what are the various other blood group antigens present on our red blood cells which may become sometimes leads to the allo immunization especially during the course of blood transfusion as well as in case of mother getting exposed to the fetal red cells so we have our distinguished guest speaker from australia professor robert flower so he will be taking us through two sessions one is to understand more about the blood group antigens other than ab1 rh followed by how we can able to manage those multi transfusion cases the clinical management what type how we can able to ensure the safe and compatible blood components again and again in case of multi transfusion cases to prevent that allo immunization to ensure that the transfused bloods are help, helpful for the patients with that basic introduction we would like to invite professor robert flower to deliver his session welcome dr flower thank you for the introduction Yeah, get the, the IT working first. Yay. Okay. Is that coming through okay? Yep. Oh, great. Now, um, can I make this the whole screen? Yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay. So... Um, thank you for the invitation to come and thank you all for coming. It's a really good roll up and uh, it's, it's great to see so many faces. So blood gro groups beyond ABO and RH. Now the first thing I'd just mention is that this is not a talk that's in any way endorsing the products of uh, orthoclinical diagnostics. It's views my, that I've developed as a scientist and somebody who's working in research. Now, there are now 43 blood group systems. This is the first 36 blood group systems that were, decided, that have been, that were described, um, starting with ABO and MNS, and then in the 1940s, RH and so on, up until AUG, which was in the Augustan blood group system in, in 2005. Um, but with each of these blood group systems, um, in the basis of clinical experience, some of them are much more likely to cause destruction of red cells. So if you have an antibody it, with ABO, you always have antibodies. So the problem with an ABO incompatible transfusion is you transfuse if somebody's group O and they have an anti-A in their circulation, you transfuse group A red cells those red cells will lyse, free haemoglobin in the circulation, DIC, and um, on many occasions the patient will die. And so the problem is when you have a, a blood group antigen present and the patient has an antibody to that blood group antigen. But it's not always as just... It, 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 um, some antibodies are very destructive and will destroy the red cells very quickly, within a few hours. Others will take a few days, and others are regarded as not particularly clinically significant. So for example, the Chido-Rogers blood group system here, um, where are we, this one, um, th there are quite strong antibodies that when you look at it in the test tube, you would think this is an important antibody, but they are not antibodies that destroy red cells because it's an added on antigen that happens in the circulation. 
So when we're looking at these, um, the first groups I'll be looking at are the ones that are clinically significant. The ones when there is an antibody, if you transfuse positive red cells, then there's going to be a transfusion reaction. And that's why in the group and screen process, we do grouping, we give ABO and RHD because RHD compatibility is important. And then we screen for other antibodies to these critical blood groups. And so the tool you, we use for that is a, a, a panel of three red cells where um, this meets certain um, guidelines that have been set up for what antigen should be represented on at least one of those cells in the strongest possible form. And so there's the other RH antigens, the KEL system, the DAFI system, the KID system and the MNS system. They're the main systems that I'll be talking about today. And one of the things that's just come out recently in the, the, the most recent I issue of, um, I think it's Vox, um, is a, a meta-analysis of the antibodies that are found in India. So they've gone through every paper that's been published about antibodies to red cells that have been found in hospitals in India and put them into a summary paper. So if you want to know which blood group antigens are important in India, which antibodies are most frequently detected, this is a great review. And if you're interested in this area, I'd urge you to have a look at it. It's extremely well written and it's a great summary of 50 years of work. <coughs> so the first of these is the Kell blood group. Kell was first discovered in 1946 and 1947 in a case of haemolytic disease of the newborn just after the direct antiglobulin test was first introduced. Um, the Kell protein is a very large protein on the surface of the cell and uh, in fact there are now 37 um, places where there are variants in this protein where a single missense mutation means that somebody who gets um, a transfusion with red cells carrying that antigen um, is likely to produce an antibody to that particular antigen. So the first transfusion is sensitization or the first pregnancy is sensitization. Then if after that sensitization there's a transfusion and the antibody is not detected and acted on, then you have a, a transfusion reaction. Now, um, Kel is actually a very important enzyme in um, the release of um, red cells from the bone marrow. Um, there are other activities of a, a, a protein that's covalently linked to Kel called DXK. But this is um, one of the most important blood group variants. And you can see um, the big K and little k um, variant is it, at this position here. So, um, that the, uh, at the position 193, a replacement of threonine, which in um, most populations is 90% is 90 and the methionine, the big K, uh, which in Caucasians is about 10%. I think in India, it's about four or 5%. But the thing is that if you, somebody has been exposed to the Kel protein, and then makes an antibody to the Kel protein, and they're then transfused um, Kel positive red cells, then uh, there's a danger of a very serious hemolytic transfusion reaction. So Kel is found in about 10% of Caucasians, about 4% in sub-Saharan sub Africans, but it's rare. I think it's in India. Um, does, is it about 5% in India? Anyone in the audience? 5%? Sorry? Less than 2%. Less than 2%. Okay. Yeah, so um, it's second only to anti-D in the risk of somebody being exposed to the Kel antigen making an antibody. So if 10% of people who are Kel negative and receive one unit of Kel positive blood will make an anti-Kel antibody. So this is um, a, a, a significant risk and this comes, uh, will um, be followed on in my second lecture today. Um, for, mo for most um, Kel antibodies, they're produced via pregnancy or transfusion. 
and anti-KEL is the most commonly encountered antibody after the ABO and RHD antibodies. Uh, when I was working at a major hospital in Sydney, we would detect an anti-KEL antibody maybe once every one or two weeks. Um, the problem with the anti-big K antibodies is they cause rapid reactions with extravascular red cell destruction and people can die. Um, before there was good cross-matching, um, the data that was reviewed found that when a person was transfused KEL positive cells in the presence of a very strong anti-KEL antibody, one in five people died. And so finding KEL antibodies and avoiding having people make KEL antibodies is a really important part of transfusion practice. Okay, the next one is Duffy. Uh, Duffy has a very different structure to KEL. KEL is a very large enzyme, a very large enzyme on the surface of the red cell. This um, protein has the structure of a cytokine re receptor. And this was found in 1950, um, 1950 in the serum of a haemophiliac who'd been multiply transfused. So the first one was the anti-Duffy A and then the anti-Duffy B was found a few years later. Um, the antigens are labile, so um, particularly with Duffy and Kid, sometimes you detect an antibody in a patient when it first comes in but then if you, do, if you look at it three or four days later, the antibody may have disappeared. It's, it's just um, uh, one of the things that can happen. And also sometimes with the screening cells, the reason screening cells have a, an expiry date is after their expiry date, you can miss anti-Duffy B antibodies. So it's important, once again, when you're using the equipment and the tools you have, to use them within the um, specifications of the manufacturer because if you don't, then you, you can not find uh, um, relevant antibodies. Um, that, uh, that this is detected by the anti antiglobulin test and because some of the enzymes we use to modify red cells to help us detect antibodies, um, cleave off the Duffy A, Duffy B, um, pot the area where this missense mutation is located. Um, if you treat the cells with an enzyme like papain that actually just cleaves off the last bit of this protein, then you'll lose the Duffy A and Duffy B antigens. Um, and once again, Duffy can, can bind, it can co cause severe transfusion reactions and is associated with hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn. Um, Duffy HDFN is usually treated by phototherapy. It's not um, a case for exchange transfusion, but it's certainly a clinically significant problem that needs to be monitored and managed appropriately. And Duffy phenotypes are one of those interesting um, things in immunohematology. Of all of the blood groups around the world, Duffy has the most um, striking population variation because um, in, in Caucasians, um, it's in roughly Mendelian proportions, 25%, 50%, 25%. But in people from Africa, nearly 70% don't have any Duffy antigens on their red cells. And this is because um, it is the recept one of the receptors for Vivax malaria. And so if you don't have any Duffy antigen on your red cells, you don't have anything for the Vivax malaria to bind to. And so it's an innate resistance to malaria. And so um, in, in Africa, in um, sub-Saharan Africa, 70% of people don't have a Duffy, any Duffy protein on the surface of their cells. And this is because of a mutation in a regulator part of the gene in the garter box, which means that, that in red cells the protein is just not, um, uh, not translated. And in East Asian people, in Chinese, Southeast Asians and so on, um, people are almost exclusively Duffy A, which is very odd because the ancestral type is Duffy B. So once again, there must have been some sort of evolutionary bottleneck event which means that in East Asian people, um, Duffy 
A is the most common phenotype. And so there is really striking ethnic differences in the distribution of the Duffy blood group antigens. And um, with the Duffy A negative, B negative in Caucasians, it's less than 1% in East Asian people. It doesn't seem to be found at all, but in African people, it's 70%. So that's a, 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 a huge difference in the distribution of the Duffy blood group protein. Okay, now the kid blood group system. Now the kid is actually a fu functions as a urea transport protein. Now that's very important in the kidney. It's not so important in the red cell. And people who completely lack the Duffy protein, um, uh, the kid protein, I'm sorry, um, don't have any problem with their red cells, but they do have a problem concentrating urine. And so this was first detected once again in 1951 when the antiglobulin test was first introduced. Um, it did cause hemolytic disease of the newborn. And once again, it's a single amino acid substitution um, on one of the external loops of this um, typical transporter protein structure. Um, it's well developed at birth and so antibodies to the kid A, kid B polymorphism can cause hemolytic disease of the newborn and they also cause severe transfusion reactions. Now, Duffy is one of those anomalies. Um, when you look on a cassette, you will see a couple of little specks, maybe a one or a two plus at the most. And so it doesn't look like an antibody that's going to cause any problems. But if the antibody is missed and somebody who has an anti-kid antibody has a, 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 a transfusion of kid positive cells, in the SHOT studies in the UK where they follow up all of the problems with transfusion, I've, over a five year period where there were 15 um, deaths or near fatal transfusion reactions, 12 of them were avoidable and because there wasn't the data um, about an antibody to a kid shared between hospitals. And so once again, um, the kid protein, the kid antibodies to the kid protein are very difficult to detect. And once they're detected, there needs to be a really good hospital record that can then be used to make sure that people get the appropriately typed red cells at a later time. And once again, with kid, pop with kid there are differences in population frequencies, um, that there is a rare kid null phenotype, uh, which is found in South China, Filipinos and Polynesians. And in that case, they make an antibody to the whole kid protein called anti-JK3. But in other populations, except for Africans, it's in roughly Mendelian ratios. And so um, the HDN is infrequent and once again mild, um, uh, managed by phototherapy, but the hemolytic transfusion reactions are what you need to worry about with KID, where um, uh, they're not common, but they activate a complement. You have severe transfusion reactions. And so uh, good record keeping and sharing of data is really important because um, if you miss this and somebody has an antibody that's just below the level of detection of your test, you're really relying on records and other people sharing their records with you. Okay, now the glycophorins. The glycophorins are one of the most abundant proteins on the surface of the red cell. So there's glycophorin A and glycophorin B. And so right at the very end terminus, there are two amino acids that define whether the, um, the person is M or N. And so in, if they've got serine at one and glycine at, um, at five, they're big M. If they've got um, leucine, oops, leucine and glutamine, um, then the, they're N. Now, anti-NM is... Um, if it's an IgM antibody, is regarded as not clinically significant. Um, but one of the things that I've seen coming to India over the years is people have reported fatal 
hemolytic disease of the newborn due to the anti-EM antibodies, that they think there's a case report from Valor um, about a, a hemolytic disease of the newborn. And so it's very important if there is an IgG antibody um, or if there's a very strong M antibody that it's thoroughly investigated um, in pregnancy. And once again, there are local guidelines as to how you manage anti-M antibodies, particularly IgM antibodies. In some cases, cross-match compatible blood is okay. In some other jurisdictions, they will actually request antigen negative blood. Anti-N is a less common antibody than anti-M because the N terminus of the glycophorin B has the N amino acids on that. So it's more difficult to form an anti-N antibody. Um, and that, um, that there are old reactive N antibodies um, uh, in, uh, that, that um, are found in saline agglutination um, and these are almost never clinically significant. Uh, one of the things that I talk about um, with um, the glycophorins is that um, there was a major change in the distribution of the M and N blood group system in Australia in 1788 when Europeans arrived because uh, when we look at the indigenous population of Australia, they are almost universally um, only N. And so in Australia, when, the Cauc when Caucasians arrived and started to settle Australia, they brought the M blood group with them. And so that was the first change of the, of the M in the M blood group system. Now, S is my favourite blood group for all sorts of reasons, um, but um, it's the big S and little s are named after Sydney. And once again, um, it was a blood group antigen that was introduced into Australia in 1788 because Indigenous Australians do not have the big S um, form of the protein. And so once again, this is an amino acid, a single amino acid substitution in the uh, glycophorin B protein. The big S form of this is mainly in Caucasians, although you do find it in India. Um, that there's, they cause both immediate and delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions. They're present at birth. Um, and the complete loss of glycophorin B, which occurs in some people from West, West Africa, is associated once again with innate resistance to falciparum malaria. And so they make an antibody that will react with everybody who has a normal glycophorin B on their cells. And that was why it was called anti-U. It's a universal antibody. And it's a very clinically significant antibody. And if you have somebody with that particular antibody, um, you need to um, work with people who have um, stocks of rare red cells because only other U negative red cells uh, will be suitable. And this is Ruth Sanger, who is a famous Australian immunohematologist who wrote a book called, with her husband, Robert Race, called Blood Groups of Man that went through six editions and between the 1950s and 1990s was the reference book before the Blood Group Antigen reference book and um, Jeff Daniels' books, um, was the important, um, the most important and widely used reference book in immunohematology. And it's interesting that this is Ruth Sanger working in the Sydney Red Cross in the late... 1950, in the late 1940s. And it's interesting when you look at it that first of all, her hair isn't tied back appropriately for were somebody working in the lab. She isn't wearing gloves. Um, she's sitting on a wooden stool eight hours a day. I don't know what the oh &S people would say about that these days. And she's wearing high heels. How many people would get into a hospital these days in that outfit? And so um, it's interesting just looking back to the 1940s, how much things have changed. And so once again, um, uh, the Duffy blood group is important in resistance to Vivax malaria and the glycophorin B blood group is important in resistance of, to falciparum malaria. And so once again, the distribution in ethnic groups around the world is related to people who lived in malaria endemic regions.
Now, I'll just talk quickly about the Luther and, and Colton blood groups because both of these are principally found in Caucasians. Lutheran is a, um, a, a, a once again, a single amino acid missense mutation um, that almost all people are Lutheran B, but in Europeans, about 5% are Lutheran A, oops, a Lutheran A, um, that it's an adhesion protein that is actually down-regulated as red cells leave the bone marrow. And so it has very variable levels of expression on red cells. Um, these are usually weak, but um, at least in an Australian laboratory, if you had somebody who was multiply transfused again and again, um, you would find that suddenly another antibody comes up and it's very likely to be an anti-Lutheran. And similarly with Colton, um, that it's um, on an aquaporin, um, that it's due to an, an alanine valine um, uh, substitution at position 45, that most Northern Europeans are Colton A positive, about 10% are Colton negative, but in most other populations, just about everybody is Colton A positive. And these antibodies can cause mild to moderate hemolytic transfusion reactions. And you will find them on most of the commercially available um, screening cell panels. Um, I think not because you're likely to find those antibodies in India very often, but these are sold all over the world. And so they have to be suitable for use in many countries. Okay, now um, I showed you at the beginning that one of those antigram charts for the screening cells. And I've talked about the protein blood groups that are important in that screening process. But there are some other blood groups that are very important in other parts of the world that are not included in that screening process. So for example, the Indian A, Indian B polymorphism um, is important in Western India and in Iran, and to some extent in um, the Gulf countries. The Diego blood group polymorphism is important in East Asia, so particularly in Northern China and Japan. They actually include Diego A and Diego B red cells on their um, screening cells. And I think Ortho has a, a panel that you sell in Japan that has Diego A and Diego B on it. Um, so Cartwright, YTA and YTB are mainly found in the Middle East, um, so that these are in both Arab and Jewish people have the highest frequency of YTB. And I call this one the world peace antigen because if only people looked at their blood and realised they were all the same, maybe they'd be nice to each other. But there you go. And the Dombrock blood group system um, has variants in African people that once again are, um, are important in cross-matching um, particularly African people in America have variations in the Holly and Joseph system, uh, uh, Holly and Joseph antigens that are important in cross-matching. But the Dombrock system is very interesting because um, the variants are very important, but almost nobody has antisera. And so the only way you can type for Dombrock is via genotyping. And so um, there are a number of blood group variants now where the best way to actually type your patient and type your donor is actually genotyping. So Indian is an adhesion protein. It's interesting because CD44 is found on leukocytes as well as on red cells, but the isoform that's found on red cells is actually missing two exons that compared to the protein found on other cells. And so a lot of CD44 monoclonal antibodies react with the CD44 on white cells, but don't react with the CD44 on red cells. And so if you were ever doing flow cytometry with this, you need to check that your CD44 antibody actually reacts with red cells. Um, so it's on chromosome one, it's a missense mutation, proline to arginine. Um, Indian A is rare in Caucasians, about 12% in Iran, and about 55% in Pakistan and Western India. And it's interesting um, that I don't know if any of you saw the story about 18 months ago of a little girl in Florida who um, had the unusual type, who was in an Indian A homozygote, 
Um, she was originally from Pakistan. She was being treated for childhood cancer and they had to search all, all over the world for people who were Indian A homozygotes to find blood that was compatible for her. We actually found um, two um, people who were Indian A homozygotes that we could bleed and send their un our units to uh, the United States as part of that worldwide survey. And so um, while those antibodies are very clinically significant, it's and, and in the population here, and particularly in Iran, um, you know, that at 12%, at, um, um, one in 100 people roughly will be Indian A homozygotes. Um, you know, that that kind of matching is really important. Um, but it's actually, uh, one of those things where, once again, genotyping is really the best way to find those people who are homozygotes and find those donors who are suitable. Okay, and the Diego blood group system, when it was first discovered, um, the Diego blood group system, once again, has a striking ethnic distribution that it's as high as 30% of people in South American, Indian indigenous people in South America, have the Diego A form of the Diego protein. So it's a single amino acid substitution, but surprise, not surprisingly, um, the antigen was, the variant was first found in Venezuela in a case of hemolytic disease of the newborn because the, the area where the, um, in the Diego A and Diego B polymorphism is in, um, uh, in South America, but it's also in North Asia. And as I said, in um, Japan and in, in Korea, antibodies to Diego A are not uncommon and um, are definitely clinically significant. It's interesting that once again, uh, and I'll get to this later in the talk a little bit, that in 1990, there were just two blood group antigens in the Diego system. And um, when I first wrote this talk, there were 22 blood group antigens in the system. And now I think it's up to something like 40 where there's amino acid substitutions, some of them very rare, but where those amino acid substitutions will re result in the production of an antibody that's capable of causing destruction of red cells. Okay, the three blood group systems where the proteins are very unusual, they're completely outside the red cell. So you have a phosphatidyl inositol um, anchor, you then have a carbohydrate linker, and the protein is completely external to the cell, sitting on the, attached to the cell membrane via that carbohydrate linker. And so cartwright, Dombrock, and Chroma um, all fall into that category. Um, so cartwright, once again, is found in the middle of the uh, highest proportion of the um, YTB variant of this is found in um, Jewish and Arab people in the Middle East. Um, that Dombrock, once again, the most important variants, Holly and Joseph, are found in, um, people, in people from Africa and can only be detect detected by genotyping. But the other thing, the important blood group here is the Chroma blood group system, the 14th blood group system discovered, because this is a complement regulator. And so what can happen is that um, if this linker is not made, um, none of these proteins are attached to the surface of the red cell. And so you have no Cartwright blood group, you have no Dombrock blood group, and you have no Chroma blood group. And so in that situation, the loss of the Cartwright and got Dombrock, Cartwright's an enzyme, um, that uh, Dombrock, I don't know the function of actually, I'll have to find that out. But chroma is really important because it's a complement regulator. And so if people lack that protein, they lack the ability to turn off complement when it attaches to the red cells. And so in this, uh, in this case, um, there's, uh, people can have paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria because of a loss of this protein and they will actually be missing all of these blood group antigens that are attached via the um, carbohydrate linker. And so as I said, these are different proteins. They're not integral transmembrane proteins. They're completely external to the cell. Now, VEL um, is a protein 
um, a, 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 a blood group a protein where there's blood group, it's a single blood group antigen. It was discovered in 1952 in New York, but it wasn't until 2013 that this was found to be um, just a 78 amino acid protein, just a tiny protein where there was a 17 nucleotide, uh, nu nucleotide deletion um, that uh, led to the loss of this protein because you get an early stop codon. And so um, that there's uh, a, a, a loss of this protein from the surface of red cells, um, which uh, means that people are vel null. Now, um, people who lack vel, the gene is about one in 500 in Caucasians. Uh, I don't know what the frequency of vel negative is in India, but um, the thing is that with one in 500, you'll have one in 25,000 who are homozygous without the, um, the vel protein. And those people can make an anti-vel antibody. Now, the really big problem with VEL is it's a little bit like the, um, the kid protein where the antibodies look weak. They look like high T to low avidity antibodies. They don't look very important. But if somebody has an anti-VEL antibody and you transfuse VEL positive blood, um, uh, once again, about 50% of the time the patient will die of a severe transfusion reaction. And so the importance with the VEL blood group system is if you have something that's pan-reactive, that um, you don't know what it is, and it looks a bit all over the place, some are stronger, some are weaker, it could be an anti-VEL. And in that case, you really need to know, because if you just say, oh, this is an auto and transfuse, which some people do, you can kill the patient. And so once again, you need to have access to a good reference laboratory and to be able to um, work out that this is actually an anti-VEL antibody, not just a nondescript high T to low VDT antibody that you can just ignore. And the key is that with this, it's pan-reactive, it's a bit variable in its reactions, but the auto is always negative. Okay, now... Um, uh, we were saying before that there were, um, in 1997, there were 23 blood group systems. Um, by about 2012, it was up to 30. Um, there are now 43 blood group systems. And it's interesting that one of them was, uh, the recent ones, um, is that the, um, the Pell blood group system uh, was found in four um, unrelated families that it's missing a membrane protein, the ABCC4 transporter, and once again, that there was a large homozygous deletion of this gene. And so once again, this blood group system that is clinically important in terms of transfusion reaction and is clinically important in terms of platelet function was actually um, uh, discovered through genotyping, through exome sequencing and analysing that exome sequencing. And the same with the MAM blood group system that was discovered in, um, in Bristol. Um, but the thing that is really interesting with the MAM blood group system is that there were people, cases of people who were MAM negative, uh, donated from Malaysia, New Zealand, um, uh, East Asia and the Pacific. Um, and so this is a very widely distributed um, null phenotype. Um, and so it's caused by inactive, um, inactivating mutations in the EMP3 protein. Um, and so with this, because it's closely associated with CD44, the Indian blood group protein, they have depressed Indian um, expression, but the key is variants in the EMP3 protein, uh, which is actually very important in regulating the division in cancer cells. And so once again, why this is in red cells, what it's doing in red cells when it's really important in regulating cell division and cancer cells is another question. But um, once again, the MAM NEL, MAM NEL, MAM NEG rare, is a rare phenotype uh, where there's a pan-reactive antibody and it's difficult to resolve serologically. 
And once again, you need the facilities of a good reference laboratory. So between 1997 and 2013, the OK, Ralph, John Milton, Hagen, I, Globicide, Gill and RHAG blood group antigens were added to the list. Um, in the time I had today, I didn't want to talk about those and their varying clinical significance. Then since 2013, there's been the Forceman, the Junior, Landville, CD59, Augustine, Cano, the prion protein is, is actually found on red cells and that encodes the Cano blood group system and that is actually found only in South and East Asia. Um, that there's the SID blood group, which has been known for a long time, but it, the loss of it was shown that it was the loss of a transferase. Um, this, the CTL2 um, a, a blood group system, um, the PEL, MAM, um, and also the M and ABCC1 make the 43 blood group systems. So there's 43 blood group systems and over 340 blood group antigens now. And so one of the things that I'd say is for people who think red cell serology is a dead field where it was all discovered years ago and there's nothing exciting happening, um, there's been a huge change in the last 20 years that the number of low frequency antigens where we didn't know what they were but we knew there was an antibody has gone down by almost 50%. The number of blood group systems has almost doubled and the number of high frequency antigens where these are antigens where there's a pan-reactive antibody and we didn't know what it is have actually gone down by half as well which is great because that means that with molecular tools you can actually analyse those. And so the, the most recent ones were the ABCC1 and the, uh, and the M blood group system. Um, and so this is a dynamic field where there's a lot happening, but there are some basic things in terms of the KEL, the ABO and RHD, of course, the minor RH antigens, um, the Kel, Duffy, Kid, um, uh, it's, they're really important in management of your patients. So thank you. So has anybody seen one of those pan-reactive type antibodies where um, the lab says to you it reacted with everything, we don't know what it is? No? You're lucky. <laughs> okay, so um, will I go straight on with the next lecture? As I said, well, <laughs> but I guess what I wanted to get across in this talk is that there's the basic clinically important blood groups that you need to be thinking about every day, but yeah. there are other newly discovered blood groups, some of which can only be described using genetics techniques that are also important and that there are discoveries being made. Um, since 2010, I think, in my group in Brisbane, we've discovered at least one new blood group antigen every year. We're very happy about that. <laughs> okay, so if there is no questions, we'll move to the next session. Because this many antigens are there, we know mainly whether it's a A group, P group, A, B or O, D positive or negative. So when you are giving this blood to the patients, what will happen? Thank you. Because blood is also, so the liquid organ. Hey, how we do liver transplant? I think everybody aware about the liver transplant in the AG. So what are the precautions we take when you are going for the liver transplant cases? Because that is also one of the organ. Similarly, blood is also 
a liquid organ it also has lot of antigens so when you are doing either transplant or here transfusion there can be a lot of complications the so called allo immunization developing antibodies which can affect the transfuse red blood cells, cells. Yeah. do you want to know about that more and how to manage that so we'll go to the next session on how to manage this multi transfusion cases that over to okay professor Thank you. Dr. Shemaj. Okay, now um, I must add with this one that um, in India you have many sickle cell patients and you have many um, sickle and many thalassemia patients. Um, in Australia, we have very few, and most of them are African or South Asian immigrants. So that. Um, this is a much more serious problem in India than it is in Australia. And so once again, the usual disclosures. Um, so I'll be just be talking a tiny bit about haemoglobin variants and then talking about how we set up um, a framework for managing the transfusion uh, in Australia. So um, with haemoglobin, um, there's switching of the chains that are associated with the haemoglobin during development because fetal haemoglobin has a stronger affinity from oxygen for oxygen and can draw it off the mother's red cells. Um, but that then uh, becomes adult haemoglobin with switching of the, um, of the chains associated with the um, haemoglobin gene as, there's, as you um, switch to adult haemoglobin. And so, um, one of the things that can happen is if there's variance in the um, in the haemoglobin genes in the in the uh, genes that code for the um, these chains that are associated with the heme molecule, um, there can be problems with um, carrying haemoglobin with chronic anemia, and um, that um, and in sickle cell disease when people go into sickle cell crisis. And so, um, once again, like so many diseases, there's a, there's a, 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 a continuum. So you can have non-transfusion dependent thalassemia or transfusion dependent thalassemias. And so I'll be thinking in this lecture about the transfusion dependent thalassemias. Now, um, I did mention before um, uh, that there had been a really good review written of the uh, that came out earlier this year of the um, rates of detection of antibodies in patients in India and this meta-analysis includes surveys of both thalassemia and sickle cell patients and so as I said it's a very interesting paper and the most common antibodies identified were anti-E the, anti the big E in the uh, RH system um, followed by anti little c, which is once again in the RH system um, and is an important clinically significant antibody. Um, but there were also significant numbers of antibodies to Kel, Duffy A, and Kid A, as well as anti M antibodies. And so, in this particular um, context, given the number of these patients who make antibodies, um, it's well, it would be good to consider little, big E and little c, as well as the minor blood group antigen matched red cell units for patients requiring chronic transfusion, as this um, will reduce the rate of product of alloimmunization and then having to um, the complicated searching for red cells. And so in Australia, we have a number of um, guidelines that have been produced by the national government guiding transfusion practice in various era, areas. And so there's a generic question, there's a systematic review, um, then a series of uh, six clinical reference um, guidelines are produced. And these include formal recommendations where there's very strong evidence and practice points where there's, a, there's well um, a, a opinion based on experience, but there's no strong um, evidence. 
then there's public consultation and feedback and then a final document has been released. There are also guidelines that where um, people have gone through a similar uh, process in the USA and the UK and I'll talk about those guidelines a little bit later in the talk. And so um, the clinical reference groups develop recommendations where there's sufficient evidence. So for a grade, um, grade A recommendation, there's a body of evidence that can be trusted to guide practice um, uh, in most, then practice in most situation. Um, some support for the recommendations or grade B is the body of, weak, of evidence is weak and recommendations can be applied with caution. So um, when you're looking at the guidance from the clinical practice guidelines in Australia, there's a guide, a guide as to this is something that is really strongly supported and you know you should really be doing this to saying, well, this is a lot of people's opinion and they seem to have done okay, but um, there's not really the strong evidence that you would like. And so um, the, the management of um, multi-transfused patients, particularly sickle cell patients and um, thalassemia patients is covered in patient blood management guidelines, module three, medical. And um, there's a link here um, to the website. Um, so these are available on the internet. If you um, type in patient blood management guidelines, you would just about be certain to get this somewhere in your Google search. Um, but if you want, um, Dr. C can, uh, Dr. C can send you a copy of the link if that would be helpful. But the other thing is that these guidelines at the moment are actually 10 years old. And as I've said, that um, uh, transfusion is moving all the time. There are new blood group antigens. There's more evidence that can guide clinical practice. And so these actually are being rewritten at the moment. So the, the, what I'll be talking about today is guidelines that are actually 10 years old and where in view of more recent clinical experience, um, these um, recommendations will be actually be amended as I said, in terms of the um, recent clinical practice and recent scientific literature. And so um, use of chronic red cell transfusions in thalassemia um, really intensified after 1978 when there was the possibility of systematic iron collation therapy was, was available um, using a home deris fioxamine um, infusions and that this uh, improved the management of iron overload which before the use of desferal was actually a major cause of mortality and early death in this patient group. The aim of the transfusions is to prevent severe anemia and early mortality that, and to promote the growth, development, well-being and quality of life in thalassemia patients. Um, they're also intended to minimise uh, and pre prevent things like the expansion of bone marrow mass that led to bone, painful bone deformities and extramodality hemopoietic tissue, uh, which can incur in the liver, liver and spleen, along with the vertebral column, all of which were extremely unpleasant complications. So um, the appearance of any of these complications in infancy and childhood was accepted as a trigger to commence blood transfusion, maintaining a transfusion level of at least 90 to 100 grams per litre. Um, and this was adopted empirically after trials. You know, I just said, what works, what um, avoids these complications? And it was just a trial and error process of this seems about right. And it's sort of in the similar kind of range to the physiological levels. So intuitively, um, empirically it worked and intuitively it sounded about the right kind of range. Um, and since the uh, 1970s, the adoption of a, a pre-transfusion hemoglobin in the range of 90 to 100 grams per deciliter um, achieved with three to four weekly transfusion has been um, accepted as optimal therapy combined with adequate chelation therapy. So also one of the complications is hypersplenism um, that requires splenectomy in at least 50% of patients. Um, in contrast, um, 
uh, with thalassemia intermedia, as I said, there's a continuum of, um, of severity of the disease. That regular transfusion can be a more common option for later management of this group. But once again, they need to be managed on an individual to individual basis, depending on your clinical experience. Um, so the Australian guidelines that were mentioned in the book, um, and as I said, that are under review at the moment, um, is uh, lifelong regular blood transfusions every two to five weeks um, to um, maintain the uh, haemoglobin level at 90 to 105 grams per deciliter. Um, the the post-transfusion haemoglobin, logically enough, shouldn't be greater than 140 to 150 grams per litre and should be monitored and extended matching to reduce the rate of alloimmunisation allo is desirable, although not mentioned in the guidelines. So as I said, uh, matching for the minor RH antigens and the Kel, Kid and Duffy um, reduces the, the risk of producing an antibody that's clinically significant. And while that's regarded as desirable, in some Australian hospitals, they will always do that. In the specialist thalassemia clinics in Melbourne, they will do that. But in other hospitals, particularly in the country where uh, there's less specialist management, um, there won't be this um, special management to try and get the um, uh, more closely matched red cells. And so in 2010, when these guidelines were first written, um, the, uh, rec the recommendation and practice point was that in patients with thalassemia, the evidence does not support any change to current practice of maintaining a transfusion of hemoglobin between 90 and 100 uh, with transfusions at about monthly intervals. So that was accepted as an ongoing optimal clinical practice, but as I said, um, these, are, these guidelines are 10 years old now and are under review. So if you look at sickle cell disease, um, once again, the, the indications for sickle transfusion in sickle cell disease are um, a, 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 a crisis. And once again, it's not standard to um, immunise all patients, but there needs to be a case-by-case -case analysis of detailed risk and benefit. Um, that the, uh, the goals can be basically um, uh, correction of anemia um, and that it's either performed acutely in the management of an acute episode or electively and in some cases um, there can be an elective exchange transfusion. Um, that elective transfusions can be one off as part of a long-term transfusion uh, pro uh, program but once again um, these should be in, taken by senior medical appropriate staff, ideally in consultation, in consultation with a specialist in the haemoglobinopathy team. And so once again, I don't know how haemoglobinopathies are ma managed here or whether there are senior consultants um, who um, are visiting medical offices at a variety of different hospitals. Now, um, the American Society of Haematology um, in 2020 actually published a very extensive list of guidelines, not just about um, the level of uh, transfusion, but about the management of iron overload, um, about the management of, um, uh, uh, of pre-transfusion testing and so on and the, the, the commenting that the transfusions remain a mainstay of therapy for patients with sickle cell disease, disease but pose significant challenges. And so there was an objective in this published paper um, to develop evidence-based guidelines, the same as the Australian guidelines, that the, the aim in putting together the guidelines was to analyse the scientific literature and actually produce guidelines where you could say, well, this, this, this and this study showed that this course of action was the best and to provide good evidence-based guidelines. <coughs> and, and so a panel of 10 leading people from New York Blood Centre, um, Pittsburgh and the Midwest actually developed 10 recommendations focused on red cell typing and matching indications and mode of, um, mode of administra administration, that's 
a simple transfusion versus red cell exchange, as well as screening prevention and management of alloimmunisations and uh, delayed hemolytic transfusion reactions and iron overload. These are a very interesting set of guidelines and for any clinician it's worth a read because they are extremely well thought out and extremely well written and to some extent much more up to date than the Australian guidelines which were written in 2010 where these were published in 2020. Um, the majority of recommendations were con conditional once again as with the Australian guidelines due to the paucity of direct high certainty evidence um, but, and there's also been um, uh, um, recommendations in relation to research priorities, which pleases me as somebody who does research in the area, um, and um, to understand the role of serological versus genotype clinical matching. Because in America, um, the, pe the people who most commonly have sickle cell disease are African Americans. There are a number of variants in the RH system. There are weak E variants and weak big C variants that are only found in African Americans. And where once um, antibodies to those blood group antigens are produced, they can only use blood from other African American donors who have those same red cell variants. Um, and if they don't, the people have really severe transfusion reactions. And so these also are a, a major um, analysis of the importance of matching and as I said in some cases with those variants in the the weak big C and the weak E variants in the RH system the only way you can actually screen for donors who are appropriate is using genotyping because the antis here are incredibly rare and difficult to get and so if you want to do a mass screening for appropriate donors you need to use genotyping. And so once again, and there are recommendations in the role and timing of regular transfusions, particularly during pregnancy, and the optimal treatment of transfusion-related iron overload in sickle cell disease. And so once again, um, as with the previous lecture about blood group antigens, one of the things that is really useful in this kind of context um, because I'm not sure whether you have a set of national guidelines in India like we do in Australia or an expert panel that's put together guidelines for India, India the way they have in the States. But using these kind of guidelines as a starting point, it's, it's either useful to use those to guide your clinical practice or um, to actually put together a panel of people to write guidelines that are appropriate for um, the pe people in India because once again the practice for African Americans where there are specific problems in their distribution of blood group antigens in the RH system and people in India may well be very different depending on the blood group variants that are found in India and looking at that review um, that was published earlier this year the V um, HRB and capital HRB, which are the troublesome variants in African Americans, there weren't any antibodies to those identified. Now, whether that's because they weren't looked for or because the tools haven't been here or whether because they're actually only, a, only found in people in Africa, I don't know that we have the answer to that yet. But, um, but once again, um, the patient's red cell antigen profile should be widely available to people who manage these kinds of patients because if they move to another hospital, it's really useful not to have to go to the expense of doing all of that serology and genotyping. And while individual um, transfusion services maintain permanent records of detected antibodies, these are often not shared and that's even in the United States, which has the best health system in the world, they don't share their antibody registers. So, um, and you know, in Australia, we have a similar problem that it's, it's regarded as a privacy issue and people can only, we can only put together a national reg antibody register if the patients themselves actually send in the card, which is, um, is a source of constant frustration for us in Australia. Where in New Zealand, they have a single medical record number and they have a fantastic antibody register. So, and in, in the UK, because shot report after shot report has said sharing this data is really important, they have a national register as well. 
And so once again, particularly for clinics that manage these patients, it's really important to be able to share the data in terms of the antibodies that the patient has. This is a matter of good clinical care and actually matching the best blood for those patients when they actually need, um, a, a, you know, in a crisis and need a transfusion. And so once again, um, because the system in India is so fractured and the number of places where blood is collected and kept in blood banks is, um, you know, is so widely dis d d distributed, um, maybe there is actually for the more unusual blood groups that these people have, um, that there may be a role for a database of genotype donors in India. So that um, in a situation where somebody has a sickle cell crisis and they need blood of a particular type, it's a national resource rather than a resource limited to a particular hospital. And so once again, historically, um, prophylactic antigen matching of matching for those, um, uh, the RH system D um, and the minor RH antigens, Kel Duffy Kid at least, um, was regarded as um, important in sickle cell disease, but not so much in thalassemia. But now the rates of alloimmunisation in thalassemia patients make it, the evidence is starting to accumulate that also um, there's now evidence, and if you look at that review from earlier this year, there's evidence that this kind of providing of um, uh, extended cross-matched blood, um, there is starting to be evidence to support that. And so um, the rates of alloimmunisation in people with thalassemia who are multiply transfused matches those with sickle cell. And so the same kind of pre-transfusion level of cross-matching would be useful in that clinical context as well. And so there's growing interest na internationally in matching as thalassemic patients, although it's not yet a standard of care in Australia or the United States, but I think this is coming because the evidence is there. And um, just as another aside, um, I don't know how many of the transfusion services in India do leukoreduction in Australia. All of our units are leukoreduced. And one of the things that can happen is that um, when, anti when um, units are not leukoreduced, um, you get a, 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 a temperature and a, a transfusion reaction, just a mild transfusion reaction, but that's inflammatory. And if the patient's in an inflammatory state and they get blood that has a slightly different antigen profile, they're more likely to make antibodies. And so leukoreduction also reduces the risk of people making antibodies. And so once again, I'm sorry, um, I, all I can talk about is what we do in Australia, but um, uh, one of the things that is um, a requirement for hospital accreditation in Australia, you can't open a hospital unless you have this accreditation and it requires evidence of compliance with um, the patient blood management guidelines where they actually demand compliance. And the... Um, the people who have this role of governance is a hospital transfusion committee. And so every hospital that administers blood in Australia is required to have a hospital transfusion committee that, re that reviews all incidents and that reviews um, uh, the practice in the hospital to see when there's been a failure of the system, where the failure has been and to report that nationally, and also to see where clinical, where clinical improvements can be made. And so in Australia, um, the transfusion practice has actually improved dramatically since this was introduced in about 2010, because every hospital now has to have a transfusion committee. And so for accreditation, a hospital must document compliance with those patient blood management guidelines, um, that staff are, re are required to make sure that requests for cross-match are consistent with the guidelines. So it goes down to the staff in the transfusion service to say, look, um, we haven't had a haemoglobin. This isn't, this isn't a fully matched unit for this particular patient who needs fully matched blood. And in a transfusion service, in a transfusion, anyone who has a role in transfusion, it's up to you to make sure that the guidelines that are the most appropriate, that means your patient gets the most appropriate blood, are your responsibility. 
and that, um, that it's, there's local accountability at the hospital, but there's also accountability for the staff who are actually doing the work. Okay. I'm going to get lots of questions about this. I can feel it in my bones. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Flower. No, no, lots of questions. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there are a few questions online. All right, okay. So we have a questions from uh, Professor Shami from KMC Manipal. Yes. So how do we approach a case if it is an having the aluminization with the antibody of undetermined specificity? Sorry? Antibody of undetermined specificity. I don't know. Your case oh, with oh, oh, I, 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 you need to send it to an international reference laboratory. You know, yes, sir. You need to find out what it is. Um, the other alternative is to do a full genotype of the patient and find their antigen profile and give them the appropriately matched blood. So um, it's either a, a shotgun approach to find what their profile is and give them the best matched blood. Um, and that also can lead to exciting things like the discovery of a new blood group antigen uh, or send the sample to an appropriate um, international reference laboratory like the one in Australia, like the one in Bristol, like the one in New York, like the one in the Midwest in the United States. Um, unfortunately, you or, or to Dr. Swati at the Institute in, in Mumbai mm. um, because um, these laboratories have special skills in um, looking at um, rare blood group antigens and seeing if there's an antibody, looking at which rare blood cells that reacts with. And they can send that, as I said, to Australia or one of the other reference laboratories to find out. But the basic answer to that is you can't, it, it's, well, you can transfuse the blind with immunosuppression and that sort of thing, but the best practice is to actually find compatible blood. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Any other question? Any so what we understand that it's important the evidence. Like already we are having in our driving license, our blood group, whether we are A positive or A negative, isn't it? Same thing, what it is expected is maybe a little more, the additional antigens. So which are very important, where there is a possibility of aluminization. So we should also get typed for those antigens and also it should be. Particularly for people who are, are getting regular transfusions. And so the more transfusions they get, the yeah. more likely they are to produce one antibody, then another antibody and then be very, very difficult to manage and have one of those pan-reactive profiles. So the, be the better they are managed when they're children, um, particularly people who are going to have lifelong transfusion, the better the, the, the outcome in terms of lifetime management. Yeah. So that will help in case of this multi-transfusion cases that. And as I said, if you are at all interested, read those American guidelines because they're extremely well thought out and very well written. And by some of the best people in transfusion in the world. <laughs> yeah. I'm Dr. Anishi, consultant critical care. I have a question regarding sickle cell disease. Regarding? Regarding sickle cell. Yes. Yeah, sickle cell. Uh, we often encounter patients who land up in sickle hepatopathy and who may require liver transplantation also. So at, if a patient is there who has a known sickle cell disease requiring multiple blood transfusions, at the same time now he is a candidate for liver transplantation also. Now, uh, have you encountered any such case where the bone marrow transplantation has an advantage before liver transplantation is my question. I don't have this clinical skill to answer that. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, you know, um, you need one of the really good trans, you know, uh, transplant um, specialists to actually answer that. Okay. Um, uh, my gut feeling would be the bone marrow first, but as I said, I don't have any evidence base for making that comment. 
And um, you really need people who are aware of the evidence to give you guidance. Okay, thank you. Thank you. My question is to ortho team. Yes. Uh, we don't do uh, extended phenotyping in our uh, laboratory here yes. till now. Uh, plus, uh, we come across uh, transfusion reactions because of minor blood group uh, very uh, yes. less frequently in yes. clinical practice. Uh, so, uh, uh, we had few patients with uh, minor uh, uh, transfusion reactions. Uh, yes. And uh, we solve that problem based on our uh, uh, routine uh, uh, Coombs cross match and uh, this thing. So uh, uh, my question is to ortho team, uh, when you uh, provide us a kit to do uh, extended phenotyping, do you have Indian antigens or you are using the uh, universal antigens like European system or uh, American system for that? Uh, say three cell type or 11 cell types? Yeah. yeah, currently we are having that general, which are the major antigens like uh, RH, Kel, Kid, Duffy, MNS, P, Lewis. So Indiana antigen is still not yet, uh, like uh, to do it on the laboratory phase, this one, those type of phenotyping antibodies are not yet available that time. Uh, still it is in the characterization stage that so maybe in future we will be able to get those uh, antibodies and then we can use it for that. But it's certainly the case that you can get genotyping done to actually identify donors who may be negative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, But I think also this comes down to the point of actually having local guidelines because um, it's all very well looking at the evidence in America but the sickle cell patients in America are African Americans who do produce a lot of antibodies where the burden of that kind of complication may be much less in India and guidelines that are appropriate for India may be different to guidelines that are appropriate for the United States. Thank you. <laughs> Some more questions? Yeah. Can you bring that? Yeah, that is. Yeah. So there's another question. In a patient with antibody against high frequency antigen, how do we go about transfusion support in emergency surgery? In emergency surgery, that's extremely difficult. Yeah, because um, already having the antibody of high frequency antigens. Yeah. So it looks like a pan-reactive antibody. Yes. So um, how do we if manage that? you have that? some idea of what the antibody is to, then you can look at that chart of clinical significance mm -hmm. and see whether it's likely to be clinically significant. Um, the other thing in that situation is to start to think about how you could do the surgery without having blood because the last thing you want to do in that situation is... Um, give the patient a severe transfusion reaction on top of everything else. And so um, if there was a simple way, particularly if it was an anti vel antibody, you are going to cause the patient a great deal of harm. And so um, in some cases using, um, you know, blood uh, retrieval of blood, um, you know, uh, other techniques, you might be able to minimise the blood loss blood vessels as you go through and this sort of thing. Um, in that situation, you really try and do the surgery. If you must do it, if it can't be delayed, you do it, taking into account that there's no compatible blood. And if you use least incompatible blood, you can cause a severe transfusion reaction. Mm. If you can, send it to a reference lab, urgent with a big mark, red mark, urgent, and see if you can get compatible blood. But as I said, there's also things like IVIG and immunosuppression that you can use to actually manage um, the problem 
but you know that's not best practice and it's causing the patient lots of problems rather than helping them having as i said having emergency surgery and a transfusion reaction and everything else is not ideal for a, a very sick patient okay <laughs> Can you comment on that? What are the reference lab where we can able to get these type of? Well, I think there's, um, as I said, there's Australia. There's um, Dr. Swati in Mumbai. Yeah. Um, National Institute of Human Hematology. Yes. There's um, the the lab in Milwaukee, the lab in New York, and the lab in Bristol. And I think there's Thierry Parard's lab in France. But they do a lot of work for people in Africa. I don't know how much they've done for people in India. But, um, you know, um, Dr. Swati has a very good interaction with um, Dr. Peyrard and um, Dr. Fishu. And so um, if she can't solve the problem, she would send it on to whoever she thought was the most appropriate to solve it quickly. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, there's another question. Want to have the comments on making origical phenotyping mandatory for sickle cell anemia cases or thalassemic patients, like all multi-transfusion cases by the government guidelines. Yes, that, that would be, you know, then every, everybody is in no doubt about what best practice is. Yeah. Yeah. So, thank you. Okay. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. I hope that's been useful and um, informative. I think my email was on the first uh, set of slides. So if you have any further questions, don't he hesitate to email me and I'll do the best I can to answer them or to send your email to, on to somebody I know who has the expertise to answer it. Thank you. So, hand over to uh, ma'am. <laughs> Doctor, thank you. Uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Bala Saheb. I'm I work as a hematologist in AIG Hospital. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, AIG Hospital uh, team and uh, our chairman, Dr. Nageshwar, and our, uh, our director, Dr. G. V. Rao, sir, for uh, letting us organize uh, this particular uh, event. Thank you, uh, Dr. Clower. It was nice lecture. First lecture was quite confusing. I'm being in hematology for long. Uh, uh, seven, eight years, I still don't understand all the blood groups and uh, implications of it. <laughs> so uh, it was a nice presentation. Thank you very much for uh, such an elaborate uh, talk. Uh, thank you, Ortho team, for uh, uh, supporting this event. We would look forward to have uh, our own extended phenotyping uh, uh, platform here, and uh, Dr. Pragati is on working it. Thank you, uh, Dr. Pragati uh, and uh, Blood Bank team for organizing uh, such a nice lecture uh, series or such a nice talks. Thank you very much for, uh, uh, thank you everyone for attending in large numbers. I hope it was useful. Thank you very much. for high tea. Uh, guys, please uh, join us for high tea, please. Faculty lounge here. Thank you. And thank you all for coming. Random.